Early onset cancer is receiving a lot of airtime as of late. It turns out that numerous people under the age of 50 are experiencing disproportionately higher rates of cancer diagnoses compared to years past. And why might that be? Well, new evidence suggests that faster pace of biologic aging is part of the reason why some people under the age of 50 are experiencing higher rates of early onset cancers, specifically gastrointestinal cancers, cancers of the uterine tract, as well as reproductive cancers like cervical cancer, uterine cancer, and prostate cancer, as well as breast cancer are on the rise. And a new analysis that was published at the American Association for Cancer Research, their annual event, which I do recommend going to, it's a really huge conference. I mean, the exhibit hall is just insane. Bristol Myers Squibb and all these big pharmaceutical companies have these massive uh, displays and so forth. That, that's why I realized like the field of oncology has major money. It's, it's, it's wild. But I did, uh, you know, attend some sessions there. That's why where I became familiar with Walter Willett's work at Harvard, the epidemiologist, and so forth. So uh, interesting to put on your radar if it does come to a city near you. But in today's show, we're going to really hone in on what these investigators found looking at the UK Biobank data set, finding faster pace of biologic aging is strongly tethered to increased risk of developing a cancer under the age of 50. Now, as we talked about before, Generally speaking, cancer has been characterized as a disease of aging. You you really didn't hear much about, you know, 20 year olds or 30 year olds getting metastatic breast cancer or ovarian cancer or uterine cancer or colon cancer. Uh, you know, when we were growing up, it was really like grandma's friend or your neighbor's, you know, retired father or something like that. You would hear about people over the age of 60 getting cancer, but now we're seeing so many high profile young people getting cancer that investigators are starting to ask why? And so it's important that we understand the cellular mechanisms and the biologic mechanisms that could be predisposing one to developing cancer so that we can focus on that as a preventative strategy. And that's what we're going to talk about today, diving into blood work that you need to know, common biomarkers, it turns out, and we're going to dive into this, such as blood glucose, such as alkaline phosphatase, uh, white blood cell count, RDW, lymphocyte proportion, albumin, and more. We're going we're gonna to really dive into that shortly, my friends. But as always, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate your likes, your comments, your shares. If you're enjoying this video, hit that like button. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. We're going to dive into some science shortly, but I just want to let you know, if you want to optimize metabolic health and you're susceptible to evening food cravings, like I am, I know many people are, ice cream, cookies, crackers, snacking and hitting the fridge and the cupboards after you should be finishing your last meal and fasting, you should check out the Myoscience Berberine Fasting Accelerator. This is a natural product that's been used in traditional Chinese medicine in China for the better part of 3,000 years. Berberine hydrochloride is now being extensively studied by Western scientists because it's so effective as a natural agent to help support metabolic health and especially curb food cravings. It has a natural appetite suppressant effect that you can actually test in real time if you do blood work and uh, if you're into really seeing how supplements work. Sometimes we take supplements and you don't notice anything. Like you take vitamin D. It's great, I recommend it, but you don't feel any different. In contrast, berberine is something that you actually feel. So you can take two to three capsules in the evening or in the morning time, depending upon when you suffer from cravings and see how it affects your metabolic health. And you can save by using the code podcast over at myoscience.com. I'll put links to the berberine fasting accelerator in the description below. Okay, so let's go back to this UK biobank data that was presented at the American Association for Cancer Research, the AACR convention. Here's one of the headlines here. Biological aging measured with blood biomarkers. In this study, researchers analyzed data for more than 148,000 people in the UK biobank. Each participant's biologic age was calculated using readings of nine different biomarkers. What I love about this, my friends, is we're not looking at some esoteric complex test. These are things that you should already have. If you don't yet have our blood work cheat sheet, go to highintensityhealth.com right now and download it for free and bring this page one to your next doctor's visit. As I mentioned, we're talking about basic stuff here. Albumin, alkaline phosphatase, C-reactive protein, white blood cell count, RDW, et cetera. The challenges though is sometimes healthcare practitioners have pre-negotiated rates with the lab company and they might omit what I think is an important biomarker, like one of your liver enzymes, GGT. I often see clients who said, I just got my annual physical, I paid all this money, but they're missing iron. They're missing ferritin. They're missing CRP, right? So it's just important that you get all these basic, there's like 26 different tests there. Nothing is esoteric. You don't need to like do all these crazy things. Just go and ask for this and your doctor, your body will thank you. Okay, so what are the biomarkers 
that they looked at. They looked at albumin. A low albumin is an ominous biomarker. You don't want to see your albumin start to drop below four. That's just something that you can take to the bank. Uh, numerous studies show that low albumin is linked with cancer and premature morbidity and mortality. A reduction in alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase helps break down different proteins, uh, even endotoxin from your gut. So when you have French fries and hope you don't have fried chicken nuggets and things like this, but when you do have liquid fatty food, endotoxin from your gram-negative gut bacteria can increase in your bloodstream and drive inflammatory pathways. It turns out that alkaline phosphatase is really good at breaking this down. So a low alkaline phosphatase is not really a good thing. We also see a zinc deficiency, a low alkaline phosphatase. So this was the second biomarker they looked at. They looked at serum creatinine. We often see low creatinine in people who have low muscle mass or who have low protein diets. So generally, I, I like to see creatinine in men above one, women above 0.8. I've seen some longtime vegetarian clients that have creatinine levels of 0 0.6, 0 0.5. Now, you don't really want to have super high creatinine levels. That would be an indicator of kidney dysfunction. So you don't really want to try to optimize creatinine. You just want to optimize for protein and muscle mass, and hopefully creatinine will sort itself out. A lot of people get confused with creatine and creatinine. Dietary creatine doesn't influence serum creatinine to a significant degree. Now, if you're taking 40 grams of creatine, perhaps your creatinine levels might increase. But if we're recommending, you know, five or two and a half grams of creatine uh, for an ergogenic aid, your serum creatinine is not going to, you know, totally skyrocket here. So again, you want to aim for about 0.8 or one for creatinine. C-reactive protein. Generally, this lower the better. Mine hovers around 0 0.1, 0 0.2. I've seen it as high as six, you know, in some of my clients who are chronically inflamed, who have joint pain, who eat processed foods, who don't exercise, you know, you do not want a really high C-reactive protein levels. They also looked at glucose. This is one of the biomarkers. A fasting glucose over 90 is no good, my friends. I have a really close friend who's involved in healthcare, was working with a patient yesterday, blood glucose fasting, 426 milligrams per deciliter. So sky high. Uh, this, and she called, she had to call 911. I mean, this and this person, by the way, is on insulin and just had a stroke and in the last six months had has two heart attacks. So think about just the chronic inflammation that is going on in this individual. With the glucose that high on insulin that's through the roof, uh, I, all the hypercoagulable states here, I mean, this person is really at high risk for throwing a blood clot, having atherosclerosis, having a stroke, which unfortunately they've already had. Uh, so glucose really matters. Um, you know, when we talk about yeah, people criticize me for talking about how, you know, eating high protein diets. Well, what about the saturated fat and heart disease? We really know that metabolic health and hyperinsulinemia is worsening the cardiovascular health. Okay. And some of these cases are, are really uh, interesting. This, this patient, by the way, was just eating all junk food. There was no red meat uh, in this person's diet whatsoever. It's just uh, sugar and junk food. Uh, what other biomarkers were looked at to look at biologic age and then make the correlation with accelerated biologic aging and cancer, mean corpuscular volume. So oftentimes on your blood work on page two, you'll see hemoglobin, hematocrit, MCV, and MCH. Turns out that MCV measures the size of your red blood cells. Oftentimes when people are anemic or have folate issues or B vitamin insufficiencies, gastrointestinal challenges, people that have celiac disease or gastrointestinal inflammation and don't know it often have changes in their MCV and MCH. So that's important to recognize. Uh, as well as RDW, red cell distribution width. And so these abnormalities are more a reflection of either poor absorption or poor diet quality. So that's something to be looking out for. Uh, white blood cell count. So a high white blood cell count is a proxy for chronic inflammation. Now, some people do just have low white blood cell counts. I've seen this uh, in a few female clients of mine over the years that are unexplainable. These people are not in inherently susceptible to infections. They don't get sick all the time necessarily. They just have a low white blood cell count. And sometimes this, these things happen. But it's more common that we see a WBC over seven in people who are a little bit overweight, have a little bit of insulin resistance going on. These white blood cell counts tend to increase, which leads us to the last of the nine biomarkers here. And this is lymphocyte proportion. So when you see the, the imbalance or the skewed ratios of neutrophils to lymphocytes, that's a marker of chronic inflammation. And so there's some online calculators you can Google to look at these uh, phenotypic ages or biologic ages if you're interested. 
But when the lymphocyte to neutrophil ratios get imbalanced, that's a indicator of, of increased inflammation. So you would look at your CRP, you would look at your white blood cell count and neutrophil to lymphocyte ratios together as a spectrum, not just looking at one in isolation. So that's important. We have some free videos over at our website, courses.highintensityhealth.com that get into that. But what these investigators did was track individuals that were born after 1950 and then after 1965, and they found that there was an imbalance in all this constellation of biomarkers that I just presented to you and a higher rate of early onset cancers. And these are people, uh, the cancer diagnosis was before the age of 50. And so it turns out that accelerated biologic aging as predicted through these common biomarkers is an indicator of, or a risk factor for early onset cancer. Now, I think this is important because, you know, there's different hallmarks, I think nine to 11 different hallmarks of aging that have to do with mitochondrial health, epigenetic stability, DNA stability, uh, pro proteostasis. I mean, there's a lot of different proxies that we've dove into before. And so when your cells start to get unhealthy, that would contribute to a deranged aberrant cell, which is a neoplastic or cancer cell. So if we want to prevent cancer, it really comes down to the basics, supporting mitochondrial health, supporting muscle health, supporting uh, metabolic health. Uh, as we've talked about here, chronic inflammation and metabolic dysfunction, such as insulin resistance, go hand in hand. They are two sides of the same coin. So it's hard to prevent cancer if you're eating a diet that's enriched in processed foods and glucose and seed oils and all the junk. So if you want to prevent the second leading cause of premature death in this country, at least in North America, cancer that is, you need to support muscle health, metabolic health, and just basic cellular health. And so periodic intermittent fasting, exercise, walking after meals. I, mean, I feel like we talk about these foundations all the time, but you still see so many people at the Chick-fil-A drive-thru or Jack in the Box, or uh, you know, I see people just buying bread. I saw some the other day wearing a mask at the grocery store, bags of bagels, soda, and chips. And it's like, I just wanna go to the cart. I wanna shake the shopping cart. I don't know about you, but it's frustrating because seemingly people are still focused on preventing a, a cough, but they don't care about getting these chronic ailments that statistically are more likely to kill them and lead them down the path of poor health and be a participant in the chronic, you know, medical system that we have, the health sick care system, as opposed to just eating healthy, whole, real foods. And that's really important. So the take home here is that we're seeing an increase in the pace of aging, and that is directly tethered to the higher rates of cancer diagnoses uh, in young people. So we need to get back to the basics, my friends, and that includes walking after meals, eating a low-carb diet, compressing the feeding window, resistance training, prioritizing sleep, circadian rhythm health, and your relationships, meaning purpose, all that stuff really, really matters. So that's what we have today for you. Hopefully you enjoyed this content. Again, we talked a lot about these labs. We've also covered the Dunedin study out of New Zealand where mindset really matters. We talked a lot about in that particular data set, which I will link here in these different videos, that the accelerated pace of aging is linked with an accelerated facial age. And many of much of that is correlated with one's mindset. So if you're saying things to yourself like, I'm over 40, I can't do that anymore. I'm over 50, I can't do push-ups anymore. If you have these self-limiting beliefs based upon your chronologic age, that is actually linked with increased pace of cellular aging, which we now know is correlated with increased risk of cancer. So if you don't want to die of cancer and you want to live a healthy, vital life free of disease, definitely check out those videos and implement some of the things that we talked about today. That's it for today, friends. I would love to know what you thought about this video in the comment section below, and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.